All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is the 2019 edition of the Salon International de la Haute Horlogerie here in Geneva. What was everybody's sort of favorite candidates for Everyday Watch? I would say that my candidate for Best Everyday Watch is actually a quartz watch, because I want to take even more heat in the comments. <laughs> um, so it's the Cartier uh, Santos Dumont. It's quintessential Cartier, and in steel, it starts at just a hair over $3,000 for a high autonomy quartz watch, a uh, six-year battery life. It's the kind of watch you could wear it with a t-shirt or a sweater, it looks great with a suit. And if the mechanical guys can get past the idea that it's a quartz watch, I think it's something people would really enjoy wearing. All right, and James Stacy, who fast roped in from a hovering uh, Huey helicopter in order to share his views with us? Uh, yeah, my choice, I actually just left the meeting. It's the uh, new IWC Spitfire Chronograph. So it's now been downsized into 41 millimeters. It's amazing on wrist. It starts about 5,700 bucks, and it's an in-house 69,000 series chronograph. And I think it's an absolute winner for both its price point and in terms of style and getting you into arguably their strong suit for a sports watch at a, a price that's really reasonable. I think that Stephen and James both kind of got it right. I didn't want to pick one, but those were my two Sorry, choices. Sorry, dude. <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, Great minds. The Cartier, well, the Cartier is like kind of a perfect everyday watch. And then for a, for a weekend watch, a chronograph from IWC, that's going to run you about $6,000 with, I think, an in-house movement and um, a great-looking bronze case that will develop some age over time. And that could be really fun to own. And neither one of them is really going to uh, kill you from a financial standpoint. Wow. All right. Thanks, John. All How right, about so you, Jack? Uh, so funny little thing about that Quartz Santos and that IWC Spitfire Chrono. I happen to pick the same two watches. <laughs> Partly it's cost, right? This is the SIHH. And, you know, it's a little hard to say, you know, like a full gold AP is, uh, you know, is a quote-unquote everyday watch. Although I think we actually have said that in the past. But yeah, it's I'll uh, stand by that yeah. for the have, record. If yeah. you have the means, yeah, why not? Yeah, why absolutely, not? it's not? a great watch. Yeah, but the, but those are those are two really strong pieces, and they're watches that you know could really make a difference in people's lives. What did you guys see that uh, made your jaw drop? What's the biggest biggest surprise of the show? This probably shouldn't have been a surprise, and yet uh, it still managed to be a surprise. And so I'm talking about H Moser with the Swiss Alp Concept Black, which is a minute repeater with no visual indication of the time, no hands, no nothing. You have to pull out the crown and set the time using a little indicator on the stem to set a minute repeater that you then have to chime to hear the time. And so that was, I thought, really interesting from a, from a complication standpoint, obviously, and also from, uh, we'll say, kind of a gimmicky standpoint as well. It's a great choice. Really cool yeah, watch. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So mine is actually not even a watch. It's the MBNF and Lepe Medusa clock. I can't really get it out of my mind. And I think it's, it's so awesome. I think it's just one of the most fabulous things. And I really like a lot of the, the LePay clocks that they've made. You can actually hang it from the ceiling on a steel line. And then it has these little glass tentacles that hook into a, a receiving system. And it kind of looks like a jellyfish where it's kind of in the water column, so to speak. Really, really cool. Like super romantic, really fanciful, but still like gorgeous. And the green and the blue especially. Crazy. I think my biggest surprise wasn't a watch, but was actually a reaction to a watch. I expected there to be some pushback against AP for Code 1159. I did not expect it to be quite as bad as it was. And, you know, it's AP doing something that's not the Royal Oak. It's not a super traditional watch. I get it. They're going to get pushback. That was never in doubt. There's still a lot to like about those watches. It might not be my first choice AP, and I think it's not a lot of people's first choice AP. And I think the pushback like kind of surprised me. I think people decided to pile on a little bit, and I expected them to pump the brakes a little more. Yeah, my biggest uh, surprise was Code 1159, and there were actually two surprises. The first was my own reaction when I finally saw them in person last Saturday night. They look much, much better to me in person than they did in the photographs. These are watches that really live in the details. There's a lot of little stuff going on. They behave a certain way when they're in motion that you really can't pick up in photographs. I don't know, I thought to myself, all right, maybe these guys are onto something here. Maybe, I, you know, maybe people should reserve judgment until they get into boutiques a little bit later on this year and, and people see them. And the second surprise was, uh, you know, I, like you, really did not feel good about the bandwagoning. And, you know, I have to say, honestly, it made me feel bad about us. It made me feel bad about the watch community. It made me feel bad about the online watch community. One of the greatest things about watches and watchmaking is that it connects us to craftsmen and craftspeople who in many cases for generations have devoted their lives to making this stuff. There's close to a thousand people who are probably responsible for bringing these things to market. The same human beings that we revere when they get it right, uh, we should respect even if we think they got it wrong. Guilty pleasures, what did you see that you uh, hate yourself for loving? 
Uh, so <laughs> I started my day this Steven. morning at Piaget's booth. They had a full flooded out Altiplano flying tourbillon. It had baguette set bezel, a baguette subdial. It was a great reminder when a high jeweler who really has know-how in that space right, uh, right. does something like that. It's not an afterthought at all. Been good at it for decades, and they're not going to stop being good at it. 100%. Yeah. James? If we're talking about, you know, something a little bit more of a guilty pleasure is, you know, the, the Vacheron Constantine overseas perpetual calendar in the ultra thin. Now they've got a full matching pink gold bracelet, and that's totally my jam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you, John? Absolutely. My ultimate guilty pleasure has got to be Bon Bon from Richard Mill. These are crazy looking watches. They are not only inspired by fruit, they have actual depictions of fruit on the dial. But underneath the dial, they are real and candy Richard. and cotton candy. Cotton candy. In, oh, so, yeah, and candy and cotton candy. This is Richard Mill uh, kind of owning the way that people view him and what his watches have come to mean uh, in high end watchmaking circles. So I think they're very cool pieces. Yeah, actually, uh, I had the same choice. And, you know, kind of for the same reasons, I think you articulated it really well. It's almost as if he's, uh, you know, pointing out to people who take him and his watches and the price point that they exist at too seriously, that, hey, this is meant to be fun. The last, last thing, the real last thing, uh, favorite complication. I'm going to pick from Jaeger the Master Grand Tradition Gyro Turbian Westminster Perpetual. Um, this is one hell of a watch. Uh, it's got three high complications done to an incredibly high level. There really isn't anything that Jaeger can't do when they want to. All right. Mr. Stacy. Yeah, mine, uh, I really love that JLC. That thing's in prison. It's incredible. For me, as far as my favorite complication, is something a little bit more simple than that one. You know, the A Long and Zun, Richard Long at Jumping Seconds. Yeah, I love that watch. Now in white gold, still 40 millimeters, black dial. And there's something about that dial that gives it a little bit of a sportiness as a few little red accents. You still get, obviously, the big animation from the jumping seconds, and it's just so good on wrist. I think the Richard Lange jumping seconds is the watch I would want personally. That movement is incredible. It's like maybe the most beautiful serially produced movement in the world right now, maybe. I mean, you can make a case for that. It's Absolutely. It's definitely up there. And I like that they, they came out with a watch that is as serious as a watch can possibly get, but they, they toned it down a little bit. You can wear it and it doesn't feel quite, quite, so, uh, quite so intense. So what blew you away at the show? I mean, me, it was the Vacheron Constantin Twin Beat, Le Cabinotier Ooh, Twin very Beat. Good choice. Uh, to me, it really sums up modern watchmaking. There's the Twin Beat complication, which is, you know, it's technically absolutely fantastic. Two oscillators, each vibrating at a different rate. You can switch to standby mode. You've got a 65 day power reserve, never been done before. Both of these things are so hilariously unnecessary, but boy, oh boy, am I glad this watch exists. You know, because that watch really kind of sums up everything that is uh, just really wonderful about Swiss watchmaking and why it deserves to continue to exist. 